why is it so important for leaders to know what gives them some level of distinction? The world is noisier than ever. You got to check your LinkedIn messages and some people check their Instagram messages and the Facebook message and the over there. There are all these megaphones shouting at us. You know, Glenn, you know, you probably know this. This is the first time in the history of the United States that our economy, our workforce is shared by five different generations. It's never been this crowded. And I'd argue there's probably a sixth generation. It's not Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, it's Gen AI that's crowding our workforce where people you know, are feeling drowned out. So the ability to stand out in a way that's memorable, I think is more important than ever. And I think it's going to be more important next year than it is this year. You are listening to Personalization Outbreak, a podcast about the collapse of traditional corporate standards in today's more personalized world. I'm Glenn Yopis. I'm a leadership strategist, author, contributor to Forbes, and founder of the Leadership in the Age of Personalization movement. On this show, I'm interviewing executives across multiple sectors to find out how the balance between standardization and personalization can exist. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Personalization Outbreak Podcast. What gives you distinction? In fact, what makes you uniquely different as a leader? In fact, why do these questions even matter? I mean, I've learned throughout my career that what separates the best leaders from the rest at a very high, at the highest level, not only benefits the leader, but more so, and more importantly, is the significant impact that that leader has on their team's performance, morale, and the organization's success. But notice the key words and the order in which they were mentioned in this statement, significance and success. In other words, the significant impact a leader can have on others inspires and guides people towards success. In other words, you know that you are distinct when you could have long lasting impact on other people's lives. Now, to help us better understand how a leader can identify their distinction, I've got my good friend here, or my new friend here, who will be a good friend, uh, William Vanderblumen, founder and CEO of Vanderblumen Search Group. He's also the author of the book, Be the Unicorn, the 12 Data-Driven Habits that Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. Now, keep this in mind as you're listening to William shed light with his wisdom that he has interviewed and researched over 30,000 top leaders to help him identify these 12 key habits that he's going to share with us. But before we get started, please click the like button below, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media at Glenn Yopis. William, welcome to the show, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Glenn. It's a pleasure to be with you. So, William, why does this topic matter? Like, why, why is it so important for leaders to know what gives them some level of distinction? Let's start there with the conversation. Yeah, that's a great question, Glenn. I think, um, I think what I'm realizing is the world is noisier than ever. Hmm. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean, there's social media channels that you, you can't just answer your email anymore. You got to check your LinkedIn messages and some people check their Instagram messages and the Facebook messages and the... Over there, there are all these megaphones shouting at us, and it makes the world really noisy, and it makes it harder. At the same time, harder, and also more important than ever, for leaders to show distinction, like what sets them apart, what makes them uh, stand out of the crowd. I don't know, Glenn, if you've you've had this happen. Most people have. You you meet someone. It might be you're hiring. It might be you're in an elevator. It might be at a cocktail party. I don't know. But within five minutes of meeting this person, you're like, I'm all in. I want to hire them. I want to sign up for their email list. I'm going to listen to their podcast. And it's like, what has this person done that, like, do they, have they, do they know how to put a spell on me? I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I'm not the most gullible. What, what is that magic that happens that makes me remember them and not the 99 other people I met that night, Right. That was a question that drove the whole research project that led to this book. And, and we can get into the details, but like the need to stand out, huh? The, you know, Glenn, you know, probably know this. This is the first time in the history of the United States 
that our economy, our workforce is shared by five different generations. It's never been this crowded. And I'd argue there's probably a sixth generation. It's not Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, it's Gen AI that's crowding our workforce where people you know, are feeling drowned out. So the ability to stand out in a way that's memorable, I think is more important than ever. And I think it's going to be more important next year than it is this year. It's just gonna continue as automation and uh, and technology continue to make the world less personal. You know, it's interesting. As you were talking, you made me realize that whoever's out there listening and believes that they're a subject matter expert, William basically told you, you may have been one last year and you may not be one now because how noisy it is. In other words, we, we've grown up, at least you and I, in these recent years, uh, in a world where apparently everybody is an expert. I mean, I bet, yeah, everyone has distinction. And it's almost become so artificial, we don't even know what to believe is true. But you said something and implied it very eloquently. If you're in that cocktail hour and you meet someone and you start signing up and saying, man, this person had an impact on me, it's because how they made you feel. And I think this is really important because as I listen to someone like you, you're super authentic. But what makes you authentic is you've given me the impression that you don't have any agenda other than what to help somebody and to relate and connect to them. Hmm. But how do we even begin this process of understanding what makes someone indispensable. I know you've got an opinion on this, William. Yeah, well, I think understanding what makes someone indispensable uh, in the workplace, right, is not whether or not you like them. I mean, that's a big thing, uh, but it's not whether you want to hang out with them. Uh, it, it, we cover it in the chapter uh, called likability in the mm -hmm. book. There, so that is a piece of it. But really what causes people to stand out in the crowd is uh, – uh, it, well, let me back up. During the pandemic, everybody shut down our business. We finally had some time to study because we weren't busy out on the road. Um, and we said, those people that we've met over the years, the ones that within five minutes, you just want to know more about mm -hmm. them. You wanna, like, how many of those have we met? Well, we tracked that down, 30,000. And then we said, do they have anything in, this is going to sound ironic, do they share anything in common that lets them appear unique. Does that make sense? So, Perfectly. So what what are they doing? And I thought, Glenn, you know, I and this was not, you, you're so kind to say, I just want to help people. Frankly, it started as a research project to help us be a better search firm. It was really selfish. It was like, if we can learn to spot these people quicker, we can get them placed quicker, we'll be a better search firm and we'll be unique and indispensable, right? Um, but what we realized was, when we started doing the the hard work of the data and the surveying and like really mining out what does the, what do the facts say about what the best of the best have in common, I thought we would get results like, well, they all went to an Ivy League school. Well, they all have an IQ of whatever the number. Well, they're all over six feet tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, finance, you know, the whole <laughs> like all the stereotypes quarterback, head cheerleader, all those things. It was none of that. We found 12 very consistent habits that these people shared across socioeconomic lines, across gender lines, across racial ethnic lines. Like there, it, it is the great equalizer and it's 12 habits. And you know, my, my team will kill me if I don't hold the book up so everybody can see be the unicorn. Well, we identified these 12 habits and 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 I picked that word carefully because I was assuming we would find 12 Traits. Now, in my definition, a trait is something you're born with, right? A habit is something you choose to practice. The things that these unicorns all had in common were habits. And that's when a light bulb went off in our head saying, oh my goodness. So anyone could become indispensable. Anyone could become that standout. In the crowd. Anyone who's feeling like I can't get ahead, there are too many people younger than me, too many people older than me. It's crowded. I can't stand out. I feel unnoticed. Just adopt these 12 habits and you will be a unicorn. So once we realized this was something that could be 
taught and adopted, we said, okay, this is no longer a selfish research project. We need to make it a resource, a low cost resource, just a book that lets people read the data themselves in, in a way that's not like watching paint dry. I mean, it's, you know, it moves along pretty quick and then decide which of the 12 do they want to work on. And, and I, I guarantee you that if you practice these 12 habits, you will stand out in the crowd. So let, let's, before we jump into them, you've made me think here. Why is it that we're even having this conversation? I mean, why is it that all of a sudden we have to find some level of distinction? Like, wh why is it that maybe we don't have others like you around that can help us discover that in ourselves. But you see what's happened now is that we actually have to teach these habits when maybe they should have been taught to us the entire time. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, Des, but no, no, jump in. I, I think they have been taught to us all along. You know, the joke was, I, so I, I love our publisher. I love the team at Harper Collins. They're great. We did wrestle a little bit over the title. They wanted something more plain, like stand out. There are lots of books called stand out. Yeah. Uh, and, and I said, well, what actually stands out? And my kids have all these stuffed animals. And the one thing that, you know, from their childhood that, that stands out of the pile is the unicorn. Like it's different than anything else. And, um, you know, once we landed on be the unicorn, it was fine. But the joke around the office to say, should we have been taught this all along? The, the, the alternate title that we were going to throw out there is, well... I guess mom was right. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's that's good. That's good. But we, think about that. We were taught these things. By the way, they're great. And we're going to go through each one of the 12. And they're so foundational. I, I don't even know if you can have a successful career without doing these kind of things. They're like non-negotiables. Uh, but they're not easy. Because well, we... Well, I was just going to say they're not easy because, and here's why I think it's not because they're hard. We've made them hard ourselves because we live in a world, like you said, with so much noise, but also in a world where we're constantly battling the gulf between assimilation and authenticity, caring more about what people think that we ought to be rather than what we seek to be ourselves. I mean, you got to own these 12 things. And I think that's important that you've pointed these out because- they're foundational, but you have to own them. In other words, right. as as quickly as you adopt them, you could lose them if you're in the wrong environment. So it really makes you think more holistically of fundamentally, how do you want to live your life? Yeah. How do you actually want to approach your career? So anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd take that step back a moment because you know we want to make sure that people realize that these habits have depth, they're practical, they're sustainable, but we're dealing right now in an environment in the world that may quickly pull you out of them. And I think that's the beautiful part of these 12 habits is that they allow you to be self-directed in how you want to live your life. And you've really provided a great guideline for them. So let's start with the first one. The first standout that you talk about in the book is the fast, the fast. Why do you believe speed wins, William? Why? Yeah, well, let's put, let's put a little... Um context behind that we say fast and you know glenn you're sitting there saying i'm not fast i don't even know what to run the 40 in like i move slower <laughs> hey i'm dutch okay we are built for wind resistance not speed we are <laughs> steady plotting is what we do as dutch people so why say fast well here's if if i were picking an accurate title for this habit and not one that's just like that it would be the intentionally responsive Ooh, i like that when your mom says write the stupid thank you note when you grew up here and just get back to people did you call them back already did they have you responded and and the reason we put this first is it's the easiest habit to adopt that will give you the highest amount of traction quickly because I think, you know, what fundamentally what the book is, is a guide for how to uh, modify your habits 
and stand out in the crowd. And any kind of change in behavior, change in habits, it's so helpful once you get a little momentum. So we wanted to start with a simple, like of the 12, what's the simplest to adopt that will show immediate traction? Because, you know, if you're trying to make a change, you want to build wins and build momentum and keep rolling. Uh, So when I say speed wins, here's what we found. Humans are horrible at getting back to one another. We're just terrible. And, and we found it, we studied uh, like response times for salespeople once they receive a lead, terrible. Like if we had an hour and a half, I could walk you some through some of the research where, you know, mountains of research show that if a sales guy gets a lead, if he responds to it personally within a minute, it's like a 98% chance they're going to get another call. Okay. Um, if you wait 20 minutes, it drops. If you wait an hour, it drops. If you wait 24 hours, the chances of you getting to talk to that lead ever are less than 1%. And the industry standard from the major studies that we looked at is most salespeople take 42 hours to get back to a lead. So they're basically just throwing things away. They could just just respond immediately and intentionally, not like an auto bot or something like that. Intentionally and quickly, people will get back to you. You will be remembered. Speed will win. It's not hard. I don't know if you, you've you had this experience, Glenn, but I'm always amazed. Somebody told me this when I was like 18 or 19 years old. I was trying to make a left turn out of a parking lot into traffic, right? And it was busy. And we got up there and I had a chance and I didn't take it. And they're like, oh, man, those left turns are hard. You need to take the very first chance you get. <laughs> Same with responsiveness. The very first chance you have to intentionally respond you should take, and it will mark you as different than the rest of the crowd. We even looked, Glenn, we we talked to internet dating sites about what's the average response time when it's a database full of somewhat lonely people looking for someone to share life with, and they get a lead, and they don't follow up. Like, nobody follows up. The unicorns that we've interviewed over the years, the 30,000 It's remarkable how fast they get back to us. Easy, easy habit to adopt. It'll show you a lot of traction and it'll get you on the road to to modifying the other 11. It's like if you ever go on a diet and you actually do lose five pounds, you're like, now I'm excited. I want to lose the next. I want to. So we wanted to start with attainable momentum. And we think that uh, intentional responsiveness or the fast is the easiest way to do that. Well, I think that let's build on these. Let's have some fun. To be that, though, you do need number two, the authentic. Why is authenticity so important? Because I got to believe that part of that follow-up is if you don't trust yourself or who you're going to call or you have enough confidence, you're not following up. No, that's right. That's right. And and I think if you read this book and you start to adapt these things into your life, you're going to realize all 12 of these are really interconnected deeply. So it's, it's not just one, but they'll all start to show up. Like, I said the intentionally responsive, right? I am so tired of an auto bot meeting me when I go to a web page. Like, that's not authentic. I'm here to help. Do you have a question? There's nobody there to help. It's an auto bot. I like, but if you can show genuine interest and authenticity in that interest, you it, it's rare. People don't do that. Most people wear masks. Most people are not authentic. And the, and the interesting thing here, here's a line I'll never forget. Somebody told me a while back. If you're trying to be interesting at a party, the best way to do that is to be interested in everyone at the party. Have you ever sat down with anybody and, and it's like, man, we were, it, they made me feel like I was the only person in the room. Of course. It, If you will, the most successful people I've ever been around deflect the conversation away from themselves and toward the person they're talking to. I've had literally, I mean, this sounds name dropping, but I've had presidents of the United States that I've tried to talk to about them and they flip the conversation back onto me. It's it's remarkable. You can see it even in the most basic things like, uh, you know, if you're in any kind of major city and there are homeless people around uh, you know, there are a lot of smart people with varying opinions about whether to hand out money or not. I'm, I'm not, you know, a part of that. But let me tell you, you can do for a homeless person because we work with a lot of rescue missions and and homeless people. What do they need? Money, maybe medication, maybe 
Uh, but what the heart really wants, if it's a homeless person, is to be seen. This is the whole point around this, is that the authentic one gives you the dignity that you've lost a long time ago. In fact, I would actually blame the workplace for this, and I don't mean to insult anybody, but when you've been told what to do inside the box you're given, it's really easy to lose a sense of who you are. Yep. In, in fact, you oftentimes lose your, lose your dignity because all of a sudden the organization becomes your identity. So I love this one. Let's now move to the agile. Tell us how agility rids one from fearing change. Yeah. yeah. Are you a runner, Glenn? I, I well, I was. How about that? Well, you look like you're in shape, so I figured. I am. I do F forty five three times oh, a week. Oh wow! Go, go ahead. Wow! Yeah! Wow! Yeah! So I've I've been. I'm a jogger is probably the better word than runner. Uh, you know, but I it, when I hit forty, I I realized if I didn't stretch, I was going to get injured. And I hate stretching. You oh. know, I hate it. <laughs> Same here. And it honestly, it's harder than the run. I mean, the exactly. stretching afterward, I probably sweat more. So when I was about 40, I was stretching after I'd run six miles, which is not a short thing. But the 15 minute stretch afterward was the harder workout. I'm sitting there dying, trying to touch my toes. Our littlest one walks in. She was probably two at the time, something like that, toddler. And she just looks at me sweating and, you know, struggling. And she sits down next to me. <laughs> You've probably seen a kid do this, ties herself into a human pretzel as only little kids can do, looks up at me and smiles and then unties herself, stands up, laughs out loud and leaves the room. Not one word said. And she's just laughing at the fact that I can't touch my toes. And, and it dawned on me, William, every day you're alive, you get less flexible. Time calcifies personalities, behaviors, teams, businesses, puts us in boxes that worked one day, but don't work anymore. Agility, we found in studying these 30,000 unicorns, they actually can pivot. And, and I, I, everyone's tired of that word after the pandemic, even though it was four years ago, but pivot, the really the ability. And if you think back, think back to four years ago in your workplace, who, if you're a CEO listening, who stood out in the crowd during that time? The, ones, the agile ones. <laughs> the ones who learned new things. Yes. And long before the pandemic, there were countless studies saying the last 10 years has had more change than the 100 before, and the next 10 years is going to have more change than the last. So the world is, the, the rate of change is going faster and faster. And that's before AI was even a thing. Change, 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 change. It's going to keep happening faster and faster. So to me, if you can develop agility, like uh, almost declaring war on getting stiff, if you can develop agility, you will stand out in the crowd, not just today, but even more tomorrow and the next year and the next. William, I love it. So I have to share this as, as a, hopefully as a point of inspiration for those that are watching and listening. About 10 years ago, I couldn't, I just, I couldn't not only touch my toes, I couldn't touch my knees. I spent a year and a half in uh, physical therapy, hmm. stretching to reclaim my flexibility. Yep. Uh, these things are more evident than we think, but you're, you're, you're speaking to me because that was me uh, stuck in a rut. And Everyone gets stuck in a rut with time. <laughs> the rare individual is the one who says, I will commit to stretching and getting more agile. That's very rare. And if you'll decide to do it, it's not impossible. You're, well, I can't do that. No, 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 no. If you can learn to force agility on yourself, yep. you will stand out in the workplace and claim an individual and unique place in your company. No doubt. No doubt about it. Okay. So because of time... Let, let's see if we can if we can go into the speed round now. Okay. So we've been sure. through the fast, the authentic, the agile. Yes. So I'm gonna move down this list uh just what the uh the standout is, and then you tell me why it's important or why sure. it matters. Is that okay? We'll give it a go. Let's do it. Good. Let, let's have some fun here because the goal, and again, I want to make sure that everybody knows be you can unicorn. 
go to Amazon, buy William's book. Uh, I know him well enough to know this. This is not about book sales for him. It's about creating a platform of significance to help you. Uh, because there's one thing I've learned uh, about working with people like William is that uh, they're really others minded people. Mm. And uh, because they put an emphasis on taking what they've learned and helping people share what they know. So with that in mind, here we go, William, the solver. Yeah. Um, uh, so there are two kinds of people in the world, Glenn, people who live on the problem side of an equation, people who live on the solution side. Most of us prefer being on the problem side. This is what's wrong. This is what should happen. This is, I, you know, the solution side is, well, how do we find a way to make a different reality? That's Love very it. How do we find a way to make a different reality? I love that. The anticipator. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you play golf with a really good golfer, but they don't just tee off willy nilly. They look where the pin is on the hole and then they work backwards. Or if you play with a really good billiards player, they're not hitting the shot they're hitting. They're thinking of the shot that's five shots ahead. Very, very rare. Not hard to adapt, but will set you apart from the crowd. The prepared. Uh, yeah, I mean, Boy Scouts, right? I guess it's Scouts now. But like the people who actually do their homework, very uncommon and not hard to change as a habit. By the way, my brother was a Boy Scout. And he was an Eagle Scout. That's awesome. The self-aware. Oh, this is the hardest one. Oh, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's the it's you know this is the one that um, we interviewed the, the, the we interviewed all thirty thousand. We surveyed them all, and we asked them to force rank which habit are you good at, which habit are you not. And the last place, a, a clear winner of the one that everybody thinks they're terrible at is self-awareness. And, and these are the unicorns. These are the ones who are so. And, and the punchline is we also surveyed 250,000 people in the general population. And 91% of them said, I'm better than average at self-awareness. 91% of a group is not above average. No, not even close. <laughs> so it's like this giant blind spot. If you can just start to understand yourself. And you should go Google. Vanderblum and tell me about yourself. And you'll find an article that's kind of gone viral about how do you answer the question, tell me about yourself in an interview. If you can develop some self-awareness and then link that to the team you're trying to serve, here's why I think I would be good at this. You are a team that moves really fast. I love moving fast. I hate slow and predictable. See, just a little knowledge of self can set you apart from the crowd. The curious. Oh, my goodness. Don't you know the smartest people in the room are asking more questions than giving answers? It's so true. In fact, it makes me want to know more about them. That's That That's says right. everything right there, right? That's right. The connected. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's so clear with social media and such, but who is it that can connect dots and connect patterns? Like, oh, this person would belong here, but this could go here. The, the people that can spot patterns, especially among humans, will stand out in the crowd. Especially those connections that normally wouldn't be connected. L likeable. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, interviewers call it the beer test. Would you want to have a beer with a person? Because if you wouldn't, why would you hire them to spend the whole day with them? Uh, likability is attainable. It's not just how do I become likable. And we put some very clear steps in the book to uh, try and help people up their likability. What's one of them? Um, ask questions about a person rather than tell them about yourself. Interesting, right? It, it comes back to being others minded. That's right. The, the productive. Yeah. I, you know, there's a fabulous clip from President Obama about who he would hire. And he said, you know, I'm forever walking in a room and hearing people talk about what can't be done and how we won't be able to do this. And here's the problem that happens. He said, the rare individual that says, I got it. I'll take care of it. Give it to me. I'll get it done. And he basically said, if you will just go get stuff done in your job, you will stand out because it's pretty rare. It kind of goes back to the solver rather than the problem person. You know, when you when you said that, 
uh, William, it reminds me of how we, we've lived in this surface level world for so long. And now it's time to go deep. Mm. But but why are people afraid to go deep? Because it means they're going to be have to be held accountable. Yeah. And I think that's what the message here is. It It's such a simple thing to do is just take initiative, make it happen. Don't ask for permission, just go. And I think this has to do, and it's connected to the last one is purpose driven. Yeah. I know that that one speaks to me because for 11 years, my pastor was Rick Warren over in Orange County, California. So tell me why this one matters. Yeah, we found the highest performers are all driven by um, a North Star. Hmm. And and it, it could be different forms of North Stars. Um, there's some ambitious salesperson listening right now. Their North Star is to break $4 million in sales and break the company record. And that's the North Star. It's getting them where they need to go. There have been some pretty bad people in the world who've led really bad movements like Hitler. I mean, that's terrible. He had a, a North Star. It wasn't just I'm going to wander through life. He had a Now, what we found was the more noble and high your North Star is, the mm -hmm. more you will stand out in the crowd. That doesn't mean preach on the street corner and, and go try and convert people to whatever your religion is. It just means if you're working at a higher level of a, looking for a better world, looking to help people. It's like Tony Robbins says, if you spend your day trying to help others, you will never run out of business. So true. So true. So as we wrap this up, William, I, 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 let's go back. I mean, you you run a, a successful search firm and uh, you guys work with you know lots of hiring managers. Uh, what can they do with these habits as the yeah, when they're yeah. when they're interviewing people? I mean, tra let's translate this back to your work because let's call it what it is. There's a lot of people right now they're not happy at work. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I personally believe that reinvention has to become one superpower because this is not ending. I mean, your business is going to continue to grow. Why? Because people are going to be in this constant need to reinvent. Because mm -hmm. just because you're happy working for someone today, that may not be the case tomorrow. And I'm not talking about one day to the next, but one year to the next. I mean, this is where I see things going because what an organization is trying to solve for, how they want to grow, we can't always make the assumption that we have the right talent to align with the organization's business strategies. And these strategies are going to happen faster and change and move. So now that I set it up, how can this all help a hiring manager? Well, I, I know we're toward the end of our time. So I just say in the book, there is literally a section, a, a call out box for everyone in the habit saying, why hiring managers love this, how to interview for this. So it's pretty straightforward and it's different for every one of the habits. So what's the first step readers should take to stand out from their peers? What's the first step? Uh, buy, buy the book. You know, well, we know that. We know that. We got to buy right. the book. Well, you're so right. This is not, I mean, unless you invent something called Harry Potter, you don't make money writing books. So it's not, <laughs> it's really how do we help? Um, you know, if you wanted a different first step, you could go to uh, theunicornbook.com and you'll see all kinds of things. We just some bonus content, some free things in there. Uh, and you'll even see we built a software tool where you can take a unicorn index to see what you're naturally wired to do best and where you need to do the most work. And then you can decide, uh, there's smart people who do it both ways. You can work on your weaknesses first or your strengths first. I, I don't want to debate that, but at least you have a roadmap for uh, places to start. And the, and the cool thing about the book is the chapters are fairly non-sequential. So if you wanted to start with your weakest or your strongest and then go to another chat, totally possible. Well, William, hey, thanks for your time. You're uh, you're a lot of fun. This has been very conversational as it should be, but I uh, really appreciate your time. Do you have one more piece of wisdom that you want to share uh, with the audience? You know, I, I, I think mom was right. Probably the things you heard growing up are the things you ought to focus on, and it really will set you apart from the crowd. That's a great way to end it. William, thanks so much for your time. You and I will be in touch soon. Thanks so much, Glenn. I appreciate you. And thanks for having me today.
You're very welcome. And as we end every show, when you lead in the age of personalization, you will see things that others don't. Do what others won't and keep pushing when prudence says quit. Thank you, William. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for listening to Personalization Outbreak. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. If you enjoyed the content, visit ageofpersonalization.com to check out our free streaming video series and learn how to get involved in the movement. I'm Glenn Yopis. I wish you a good day. And remember, without strategy, change is merely substitution, not evolution.